of you this morning. Trust that you had a blessed week. Very different kind of Thanksgiving week, I'm sure, for many of us. And uh, uh, yet there's still plenty to be thankful for. Um, even uh, amidst all the difficulties we're experiencing. And it's not so unlike our story that we've been talking about for the last several weeks and want to continue to do so today. It found in the book of Job. We, um, we often talk about the patience of Job. And we're going to say some things about that as the... Uh, you know, as we talk about it today and as we resume back in, in, in the uh, next several weeks from now, when we come back to Job. But um, this is somewhat of a misnomer in some ways. Uh, because as we understand patience, once you read the entire book of Job, as we understand patience, he was anything but patient. Uh, what we typically think of as patience is more like self-control. When people lose it and they say, I'm, I'm running out of patience. No, we probably run out of self-control. The word patience is very different in the scripture. We're going to talk about it as we get through. But if you notice, if you, when you, if you were to read this entire book, and I trust that some of you will do that, maybe in the interim between today and when we resume in January. If you read the entire book, you'll discover that Job wasn't as... As patient as we typically think of, he argues with God all through this book. But there are two incredible characteristics or spiritual qualities, if you will, that Job had that I want to focus on today and the next time we resume. And they are their forbearance and faithfulness. Now, you know, we've, in case you haven't picked up on it yet, we've been trying to st- st- stick with the. Uh, um, uh, Job's uh, fear, we talked about that the first week, then we talked about his fortune and fame, then we talked about his family and favor, then we, then we talked about uh, fatal, uh, his uh, uh, fatalities and his fatalism, if you will. Today we're going to talk about his forbearance, his forbearance. And this means patient in the sense of uh, long-suffering. Now, we talked about the combatants in his life, the last couple of weeks, namely God and Satan. Who's, and Satan, of course, started this entire mess with his prideful assertion that Job would not maintain his integrity, his faithfulness, uh, through uh, adversity. If bad things happen to you, uh, you're going to give it up. And that was, that was Satan's belief. That's what he said to God about Job. You, you take away everything he has and, and he'll deny you, he'll lose his integrity, he'll lose his faith. Uh, if you, then subsequently, if you, if you uh, uh, touch his body, if you give him a, a, a physical problems, he'll certainly do it. Now, of course, uh, the other combatant is God, who brought Job up to Satan in the first place by said, have you considered, by saying, have you considered my servant Job, kind of dangling him out there like a carrot, you know, in front of a in front of a mule or something, you know, to see if he would take a bite out of it. It was God who had Job's attention throughout the story as the one who's actually perpetrated this evil on him. And yet Job really never mentions that in his discussions, only as the story winds up being written. And we'll come back to that later. But if you will look in the second chapter this morning, and we're at verse 10, and we're all going to look at part, part of verse 10 because we've broke, broken this down into two messages. Uh, you know, sometimes we cover large blocks, and then sometimes we cover small blocks. Today is a small block. Look at, at uh, Job chapter 2, verse 10, and we're looking at the first part. This is after his wife has said, look, we've had enough of this. Curse God. Give up your integrity. Let's die and get this over with. Now, I guess that's easy for you to say if you're not the one dying. But uh, uh, she didn't say, let me die and get this over with. She said, you go ahead and die and get this over with. But in verse 10, he replied, that is Job, he replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Now, last week we introduced you to a word. What was that word, special word that we talked about? Anybody remember? Theodicy. Theodicy. Anybody remember that word? Anybody here last week? Okay. 
I, I, I talked about it. I don't know if anyone heard it or not, but I know I talked about it. Theodicy, and it has to do with the seemingly evil ways of God. And Job was dealing with that. But Job had a comprehensive idea of his theology and his the, and theodicy because he understood both the goodness and the seemingly evilness of God. And so let's look at this just a little bit this morning as we break down these words that we read here as Job has challenged his wife to some extent. First of all, we see Job's new adversary. The new adversary is his wife. And um, as we think about her, we think about all these years. Obviously, they've been married a long, long time because they had ten children and they had acquired a whole lot of stuff. And so we look at her and we say, well, here she must have been a wife of, of, of faithfulness. We actually referenced this in an earlier, earlier sermon when we were talking about family. She had to have been a strong contributor to the marriage and to the establishment of building a family, which included having children, making a home life, working hard to help uh, uh, secure or procure all the possessions that they had. From, from all intents and purposes, we would think if we didn't know, if she had not come to him and said this, we would have thought of her as perhaps the ideal woman that's described in Proverbs 31, beginning with verse 10. Uh, you know, the ideal woman, because she's having to put up with a man who's having to put up with all this stuff. She couldn't have been a blessing to him and not have been a dutiful mate. So she's a lot better than gets shown here. But she has developed what we would call a disheartened, disheartened attitude. Because she watches the events that have transpired and she experiences with Job all these losses of things that they possessed, all, the, all that they own. Now, I want to point out something at this point. I say it's just in this story that we get this image of, of, of a single woman who's the one that's caving in. Men are just as capable, and I think in many cases are more capable, of caving in under the stress of, of going through this kind of thing. So we're not, uh, th this is not indicative of all women. Most of the women I know are a lot stronger than the men I know from the standpoint of this. They can, they can tolerate a whole lot more. Uh, my experience uh, with the two closest women in my life, my mother and my wife, can, I can test to you that they can both put up with a whole lot more than either my father or I could have. But she goes through this disheartened attitude and she watches Job and she sees him go through this incredible misery of losing everything he had worked for and then all of us have all of his family taken away. Now, you know, that's got to work on you. It's got to work on you. But the problem is, you see, she allows what she sees and experiences to destroy whatever belief or faith or integrity she might have had. She's, you know, it, it, like a point for some of us, she's had just about all she can take. And if you look uh, uh, back at verse 9, we read it there. It's, it's, we mentioned it a moment ago. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. This in verse indicates that she's basically given up. This is the end. And people get like that sometimes. Now, some, and I, I'm going to mention this. It's not in the notes. Mention this right crazy. You know, sometimes we say the Lord will not put on us more than we can bear. You know, that doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. Now, what it does say in 1 Corinthians 13 is the Lord will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able to withstand. That's two entirely different things. Okay? And sometimes people just have all they can handle. And I'm not giving people an excuse or an out, but let's, sometimes we need to be a little bit more uh, uh, gracious and merciful toward people when they reach what we would think the end of their rope, so to speak. Well, let's think about that. So, but this verse, verse 9, indicates she'd given up. Indicates she's encouraging Job to do the same thing. I've, I've had it. Why haven't you had it? And so she tells Job, Job to drop his integrity and his faithfulness and curse God and die. Now, interestingly enough, this is exactly what Satan told God that Job would do if God laid a hand on him and messed him all up. Yeah, you take away all his stuff, you, you uh, take away his family, you take away, you take away his health, and I guarantee you he's going to give up his integrity. He's going to surrender his faith. 
John Chrysostom was a, uh, a church father in the uh, 4th century A.D., and he made this comment. He said, the reason that Satan, that we, we talked about, uh, you know, you would think uh, maybe the first person that would have been taken in all this to, to hurt Job would have been his wife. But John Chrysostom, uh, Chrysostom says that the reason that Satan did not destroy Mrs. Job with the rest of the family was in order that he might use her as his tool. Uh, the proverb writer talks about it extensively that there's one of the worst things that you can have is to, is, is, ever is to be in a house with a nagging woman. Okay? It's not much better for women to be in a house with a nagging man, but obviously it's, uh, you know, that's... And so she, she realizes where this has gone, and so... But Joe's, Joe's reply was interesting. You're talking like a foolish woman. You're talking like a foolish woman. Now, anyone can be foolish. There's not, there, no one has a, a monopoly on being foolish, I guarantee you, because every one of us in this room at some point in time has either said something or done something foolish. If I were to go around the room today and you had the opportunity to confess your foolishness, uh, we might all marvel, and then, you, and then we might be, all, all the time we might be saying, well, that's nothing. You know what, what I did, such and such. It doesn't take a lot of effort uh, to be foolish. Well, anyone can talk like a foolish person, a man or a woman, doesn't matter. Because it, what happens is it's revealed through the mouth what is actually going on in the heart. That's why we can say some stupid stuff sometimes and not, and not really think about it. Now, at this point, Job could have actually looked at his wife and accused her of blasphemy. Because he says, you're talking like a foolish woman. But when she says, curse God and die... Cursing God is a denial of God. And that's where she is at, at, in her faith at this moment. That's why it's so significant what the psalmist wrote in, both, in, in chapter 14, verse 1, and chapter 53, verse 1, of both of Psalms. The fool says in his heart, what? There is no God. There is no God. You know, this, you know, this, you're living in some kind of fant- uh, uh, fantasy world. There's no God. But notice what Job does. In this particular instance, he doesn't attack her on multiple levels. He only chastises her for her lack of faith. Now, this chastisement, and I want to point this out in a big way here. This chastisement is, was not a license for him to criticize her in other areas. This is a big marital issue. Okay. Oftentimes when our spouse does something that we dislike, we will, we will actually... Uh, project it onto some other area if we're not careful and say, well, yeah, well, you can't cook either. <laughs> you don't have any faith and you can't cook. I mean, that, you know, uh, shortcomings in one area have a, temp- uh, have a tendency to spill over into some other area if we're not careful. And so Job doesn't do that. And that is greatly to his credit. And uh, I think it's one of those things that we would do well to learn from. That when someone messes up in one area, that does not necessarily mean that they're terrible everywhere else. Okay? So when you, we see this adversary, this first adversary, this next adversary that's just interjected into the situation here, Job's wife. He's already got God and Satan dealing with him, and so now he's got a wife to deal with too. What a happy guy he must have been. Um, now let's look, secondly, at Job's theology of good. Job's theology of good. Because he says... Shall we accept good from God? Paul's there and talk about that just for a second. What is this good? Well, for Job and those of his day, it would have been receiving the blessings that heaven bestowed, receiving them meekly and uh, patiently and thankfully. And uh, those blessings, of of course, included family and possessions and livestock and all those things. But they also included... Uh, from a spiritual perspective, grace and mercy. Uh, you read through, uh, you start talking about the early days of Job here as is revealed in these first two chapters, and you see a man who is obviously tied uh, very intimately and very strongly to the grace and mercy of God. He understood the, the kind of God that he was serving. What is this good? Well, it's all those wonderful things that just come showering down on us. Okay? Well, what about, is it for us? Yes. It's similar for us because we're sheltered by God's love and care and concern and provision and all the wonderful things he does for us. This is the way it works. Well, this is, this is the good, but where does it come from? Well, obviously, 
Uh, all this good that we're talking about comes from God. Job sees God as the dispenser of all these blessings. Now, that runs contrary to two things. We obviously know that blessings don't come from Satan. But let me tell you something else. They don't come from us either. We, we think, on occasion, that we are responsible for all the stuff that we have and all the stuff that we've done and all the wonderful things that... Certainly we might have worked hard. But I know a lot of people, and you do too, a lot of people who've worked hard all their life and don't have two dimes to rub together. We know people like that. So it's not... You know, let's be careful... Not to think that we're all self-made individuals because God is responsible for all this. Look, Matthew 5, 45, the latter part of that verse says, speaking of God, He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And, and you know, this is one of those universal blessings or a couple of these universal blessings that God gives to everyone regardless of whether they're good folks or bad folks. You know, God doesn't just send, send rain down, down the road and, and skip over every household where people don't believe in Him. That just doesn't happen, does it? And so it's, it's, it's different. Now, those who believe in the God of the Bible see this idea of the goodness of God as an undeniable reality. And so on Thursday, when we had a chance to perhaps do some thankful things... We might have remembered him in a special way. There's a great verse in the, in the book of James, in the first chapter, verse 17, that uh, I think all of us would do well to memorize. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like, change like shifting shadows. Every good thing that we have and we enjoy in our lives comes from a loving Father who cares intimately about us. Now, the problem, you see, is that there are a lot of people uh, who have the uh, opinion about any, uh, uh, any all-powerful deity doesn't work that way. In, in Job's day and in the day of most of the folks in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament... There were belief in lots of gods, but most people had the idea that these gods were either one of three things. They were either helpless, they really couldn't do you any good. You might pray, but they're not going to do you any good. They were either helpless or they were uninterested. Ah, I'm not going to pay attention to those people down there. Uh, or they were evil. You know, some people just believed that the gods that served were evil and that that's what they wanted them to be because they needed them to be evil so that when they went into the battle against their enemies, they could destroy their enemies. But our acceptance of good from God is kind of like Job's, I guess. Many of us, if we're not careful, get to the point or come to the conclusion that we are deserving of all the good stuff that we get. God rewarded us for our own goodness. Now, I'm not saying you don't get blessed if you're if you're a firm believer. I'm not saying that at all. But let's let's be careful to think that the reason that God is dispensing all the stuff that He dispenses to us is because we're perfect individuals and we've got no issues. Because nothing is further from the truth. We think goodness should be rewarded. So therefore, if I get rewarded, I've been good. And we think evil should be punished. And therefore, when evil comes, I'm being punished. And we say to ourselves, I don't deserve this. And that's what takes us into the next section of the, of the text. We just talked about Job's theology of good. Now we have Job's theology of trouble. Remember, I mentioned earlier when we began the sermon that he had a very comprehensive view of the theology, and the, of both theology and theodicy. He understood the the good God, he understood the seemingly evil ways of a God. And so that's what Job said. Look, shall we accept good stuff from God and not evil stuff that comes our way? Now, what is this trouble? When we start looking at this trouble, this evil, what is it? Well, it's all kinds of things, isn't it? There's a comprehensive kind of definition. It's evil or injury or wrong that may happen to us. It's kind of the opposite of good in all its forms. And it's always a matter of perception, if you will, and perspective as well. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Can we always tell the good from the bad? 
Can you always tell the good from the bad? Now, when it comes to spiritual matters, what is sin and what isn't sin, it's easy to tell. Why is it easy to tell? It's laid out for us, isn't it? I mean, it says right there on the page. You know, we know this is even, we know this is so, when it comes to that. But when we start talking about the events of our lives, how do we always know whether the event is a good thing or a bad thing? How do you always know? Because there are bad things that happen to people all the time that somehow turn out for good. Many years ago, there was a, a cruise liner that was attacked by pirates. And I, I, I can't remember if it was in the Atlantic or not, wherever it was, but it was attacked by pirates and they took over the ship. And uh, one man who was there suffered a heart attack. And so they, the pirateers mercifully uh, uh, allowed him to be taken off the boat. He gets to the hospital and discovers he has cancer. None of which would have happened, most likely, if pirates hadn't taken over the ship. Now, you can't always tell in events what's going on behind the scenes because God may be going, Hey, Peter, hey, Peter, what's this? Hey, Jesus, took a look at this. We just, we just don't know. And that's why it makes it difficult for us sometimes when we look at this stuff. And Job is trying as best he can to say, Look, shall we take nothing but good, nothing but good stuff? And, and, and not the bad. For Job, this trouble was the removal of all the good things in his life, all the blessings that he'd had, family and possessions and livestock and health. And, you, you know, and, and when you get down specifics, you can, you know, even more specific, you can just name all those things. Those children weren't just ten children. They all had names. So the blessings, the physical blessings had been removed. Even the spiritual blessings to some extent, as Job would see it, because now he's saying, shall we take good and not evil from God? So he's realizing that the hand of the Lord, somehow the good hand has been taken off and the bad hand has been laid on. And for us, we can think of it in, in similar fashion. This trouble is, is things that concern our families. Now, I'm going to tell you, and most, everyone in here knows this right now, I can't remember in my lifetime a time when uh, when the, uh, a, a local community, a state, a nation, a whole world full of nations is as antsy as we are right now. Even when we were in the midst of all kind of wars, I, I just, you know, and of course I don't remember the Second World War. It was a little bit before my time. Um, I fought the Third and Fourth World War several times in ministries, but I don't remember the second one. But... Uh, uh, I don't remember a time when we have been as, as you know, jittery and as antsy as we are right now over the way things are. Well, where does all this come from? <laughs> well, we talk about the origin of evil, and as I've used the quote a number of times, I'll use it again now. Alexander Campbell is reportedly to have said, we, we know little and speculate much about the origin of evil, where it comes from in our lives. It's the question with which we all struggle, both believers and unbelievers. We, we, can't, we can't seem to sort it out. We try, but we just can't seem to sort it out. And we always frame it in terms of, why did this happen? Uh, why did this happen? I was in, com in conversation with someone in my family just a couple days ago. And this person said, I don't understand why this person was taken out of my life when I was so young. I said, well, I don't understand it either. Uh, it's, it's a part of life. Things happen in life that, that just, just because it is life. Why does it? Why did, and the presupposition is, we didn't deserve this. I, I didn't, we didn't deserve these bad things to happen. Uh, some of you no doubt have read by now or seen by now where this uh, young, his couple, uh, he, was, he worked for Hendrick Motorsports. You see this where this guy and his wife were out on their hunt, on their honeymoon and they got hit, hit on and killed while they were on their honeymoon. In, the, in my previous ministry, there was a man who had grown up in the church that he and his wife got married. They left the wedding reception, had an accident up the road, and she got killed. We have a lengthy list of these kind of scenarios in life, don't we? Every one of us could write down multiple times when things like this have happened. And Job 
This story tries to, it, it seeks to address the question of this kind of evil coming into our lives. And now Job's thinking, according to verse 10, was that, that these calamities came from God. That's what he says. Shall we accept good from God and not evil? God's doing this. And so he's dealing with what we would refer to as true sovereignty, where God is actually in control of everything. Everything is God-ordained, both good and evil. Now the book's author tells us that all these things happened to Job because of almost a cosmic contest between God and Satan. How crazy is that? God grants permission and Satan brings trouble. We always wonder if he's still doing that, don't we? (laughs) When bad stuff happens to us, are God and Satan really duking it out again? If Job knew of this arrangement that he writes about here, why doesn't he, between God and Satan, why doesn't he blame Satan instead of causing, uh, calling, uh, 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 saying that God brought the trouble? And so Job seems to be balancing the ideas of the true sovereignty of God where God ordains everything, good and bad, with a permissive sovereignty where God is allowing Satan to wreak havoc in the lives of, of in, here in this text, in Job but in anyone else's life. Now, why does all that matter? Well, it matters because it, uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it affects the kind of God we believe in. Do we believe in the kind of God that actually sometimes brings evil? It's hard to read the Bible and not find that sometimes. We certainly don't think that we have a kind of Satan that at some point in time would bring good into people's lives, although... Satan uses the blessings that God gives people sometimes to keep them away from him, which is interesting and ironic. A second reason that this all matters to us is because it it determines to whom we affix both credit and blame. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us in this room know today that there's someone who blames God for something that happened in their life? That was tragic. In in fact, that's where we start, isn't it? Why did God allow this to happen? Why did God cause this to happen? Why didn't God stop this from happening? We all have that. And wow, the theological uh, theological perspective is so overwhelming here. Job chapter 1, back up a little bit there. Job chapter 1 and verse 21, the latter part of that verse said, The Lord... Gave, Job is speaking, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. And may the name of the Lord be praised. Wow. How do you come out of all that? Lamentations chapter 3 verse 38 says, it is, not from the, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Now that makes it sound like what? God is directly involved somehow. And even the difficult things that happen to our lives. And so Job now, he questions his wife in this matter. He's putting her on the spot with this question, isn't he? He said, look at all the good things that we have received and enjoyed through the years. I didn't hear you complaining about any of that stuff. I didn't hear you talking about, uh, you know, we got uh, got too much, too many head of cattle. Or we've got too many kids, or we've got too many possessions. I didn't hear you complaining about all that. Uh, it, it makes me think a little bit about, uh, about coaches in, in, uh, of sports teams. Uh, about 30 years ago, a coach uh, received, a whole team received a great, great, badly, uh, bad judgment call on part of officials that, that allowed that team to go on eventually and be national champions in football. I mean, it was so egregious, it was just horrible. It was a mistake, but it should have been corrected, and it wasn't, and that team uh, won that game, and then subsequently won other games, and ended up being the national champion. But you know, I guarantee you, that same coach was complaining about the next call he didn't get. Isn't that the way most of us are? Jim Valvano, the former... Uh, wild and crazy great coach out at NC State basketball tells a story one time uh, uh, the official made a really bad call and and uh, Balbano went to charge uh, went to call him on it and he said uh, the official looked at him and said now if you say anything I'm going to call a technical on you 
He said, well, will you call on me if I think something? <laughs> and the official, official said, no. He said, well, I think you think. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we might think that like God is like the farmer who went to his banker and announced that he had some bad news and good news. What's the bad news, asked the banker. He said, well, the bad, the farmer, well, so the farmer said, I can't make my mortgage payments and the crop loan that I've taken out for the past 10 years, I can't pay that off either. Not only that, I won't be able to pay you for the couple hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment I still have outstanding on my, on my tractors and other equipment. So I'm going to have to give you the farm and let you uh, just turn it over to you and you can sell it for whatever you can salvage out of it. So the banker was silent for a few moments, and then he said, well, what's the good news? And the farmer said, the good news is I'm going to keep on banking with you. Sometimes we think that's what God's like. But God is not like that. Whatever he brings into our lives, or merely allows to come into our lives, he is right in the midst of it with us, Helping us deal with it and working out all things to his glory and to our best interest. And that's why this verse I want to close with is one of the, one of the best in the Bible to, to how, kind of pull all this together and help us understand what's actually happening. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 he said this. And we know. Do we? Do we really know? And we know. That in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Don't know how he's going to work it out sometimes. Don't know what all this bad mess is going to be that we're dealing with right now, not only in this nation, but around the world. We don't know what it's going to be, but I guarantee you this, it's going to be a whole lot worse if we try to walk through it and then look back on it in retrospect without filtering it through the eyes of the Almighty. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Oh, Father, we acknowledge you as the sovereign Lord, not only of this universe, but specifically of each of our lives. And, Father, we confess to you that we just don't understand sometimes when all these things are occurring and why they're occurring. We don't, we don't always know on which side you're standing, and so that crosses us great uh, discomfort, at least, if not uh, bumping up against our lack of faith. So, Father, we pray for an increase of faith so that we might be able to withstand whatever uh, uh, fiery darts that Satan is shooting at us moment by moment, trying to get us to deny you and deny your, uh, that, uh, that you love us. And Father, we ask that you will empower us so that we might trust you even more, just as your servant Job did when he said, Shall we accept good and not trouble? Knowing that you give and that you take away. And so, Father, we walk into this new week, believing that you have something good in store for us, even in the midst of hardship and difficulty. Not knowing what that's going to be, but we trust you and we believe that you are faithful to your promise to work all things out for good for those of us who love you and who are called according to your purpose. And we pray pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.